Hello, Booktooth. Um, I just wanted to make a quick update about um, the Foundation Trilogy, which I am still reading. I know I'm taking too long to finish this book. Normally, a book like this would take me at most, at most two weeks to get through. Um, but because of my conditions, uh, working a crazy amount of hours and not really knowing when my shift ends and when can I stop working or or being interrupted by um, some of the kids and I just like there is no time to read which it's, uh, it's the first time in the last couple of years that I actually don't have time to read um, so yeah I mean I'm going slowly but I'm already halfway through Foundation and Empire I wonder if uh, another, if uh, Greg from another Wheel of Fire reads uh, has uh, has finished the three books already. Because if he hasn't, uh, I'd be surprised. And if he has, I'd love to know what he thinks. Sorry for the background noise and everything. Uh, I'm doing my best to be able to keep making videos. And uh, this is still me coming back from uh, Sean distance as a house. Um, I feel like this train ride is probably going to be my only free time for the next week until my next day off. So, it's now or never. I don't want to talk too much about the plot. There's many videos already talking about the plot. Um, uh, at this point, uh, obviously, Harry Seldon has died, but his, his predictions and his uh, historical historically architectonic plants haven't died with him. 50 years after he appears as a hologram and centuries after he is still very present and everything is pretty much orchestrated by him, everything that happens uh, to the foundation is still pretty much orchestrated by him. In the, in the, in, in, the, in book 2, in, in uh, Foundation and Empire, uh, someone starts to realize of the danger that that might mean for the Empire, even though Harry Seldon was meant to be uh, trying to protect be at St. City. the Empire the from anarchy. The train and the platform. But, um, but, uh, but he seems to be a threat to Rios, a uh, commander that seems to be a kind of war hero. And um, and he learns about psychohistory and he is shocked by his implications and I'm gonna read you a conversation and when he's talking um, with someone who knows uh, about psychohistory and his reaction and uh, what are those implications so he, someone tells to him um, okay I'll go one page back actually He's, um, he says, then explain yourself on your own terms. Why did you say the Empire cannot defeat this small enemy? They're referring to the foundation or uh, Seldon's foundation. And then uh, the Siwenian uh, seated himself once more and looked away from Rio's fixed glare. He spoke heavily because the I have faith in the principles of psychohistory. It is a strange city. science. It's reached ma its mathematical maturity with one man, Harry Seldon and died this with him, for no man since flight. has been capable of we will be calling at manipulating West the intricacies, but in that short period it proved itself the most powerful Harrington, instrument ever invented City for the study of humanity. London Blackfriars, London Bridge, East Croydon, Gatwick Airport, Three Bridges, Walcombe, Haywards Heath, Whittlesfield, Burgess Hill, Hassocks, Preston Park, and Brighton. Without pretending to predict the actions of individual humans, it, for, it formulated definite laws capable of mathematical analysis and extrapolation to govern and predict the mass action of human groups. So it was that psychohistory which Seldom and the group he worked with applied a f in full force to the establishment of the foundation. The place, time and conditions all conspired ma conspire mathematically and so inevitably to the development of a second galactic empire. 
Rios's voice trembled with indignation. You mean that this arm of his predicts that I would attack the foundation and lose such and such a battle for such and such a reason? You're trying to say that I am a serial robot following predetermined course into destruction? No, replied the old partition sharply. I have already said that the science had nothing to do with individual actions. It is the vaster background that has been foreseen. Then we stand clasped tightly in the forcing hand of the goddess of historical necessity. Of psychohistorical necessity, prompted Bar for softly. And if I exercise my prerogative and if I exercise my prerogative of free will, if I choose to attack next year or not to attack at all, how pliable is the goddess? How resourceful? Bar struck. Attack now or never, with a single ship or a force or the force in the empire, by military force or economic pressure, by candid declaration of war or by treacherous ambush. Do whatever you wish in your fullest exercise of free will, you will still lose. Because of Harry Seldon's dead hand, because of the dead hand of the mathematics of human behavior that can neither be stopped, swerved, or delayed, the two faced each other deadlock until the general stepped back. He said simply, I'll take that challenge. It's the dead hand against a living will. Um, I'm very interested in this conversation specifically because um, I feel like definitely the problem of free will which um, was quite alive in the philosophical discussions in Isaac Asimov's uh, time. Uh, Bergson wrote about free will. Pretty much every philosopher wrote or, or, or had a philosophy uh, related to free will, determinism. Um, some in a more... In, ma in, ma in many, there was many, many different approaches to this question, but because of the sort of like more scientific and mathematic implications and uh, interest of Isaac Asimov, I'm more interested in like uh, there were a couple of scientists uh, that I read an article from a couple of years ago. I don't remember the article or anything. I just remember that the thesis, like basically what they were demonstrating with their article, is that humans are just very complex logarithms, just like uh, YouTube is a logarithm, just like many other things are, and. Uh, The only reason why we think that we have free will, according to this thesis, is because uh, our logarithms are so complex that we cannot decipher them, therefore we cannot predict our own future. But if we can predict the future of a single particle, meaning uh, with, the statistical, with the statistics and mathematics, uh, we are able to like put a couple of particles in a box and predict their course uh, over a certain uh, amount of time. So be able to tell the future of this particle uh, before it happens. Then we should also be able to tell our own futures. Um, the, that question for me is, is kind of flawed, but I'm, I'm interested in knowing what you think about it. If you think that we don't have free will, tell me why. Um, at the beginning I was agreeing with the compatibilism in the sense of like even if our futures are determined, even if I was meant to be here this day and do this thing, will is more like my own inner energy aligning with that. It's not the same. It is like an action doesn't have the same implications if I am forced or if I am completely in harmony with it. So if you if you force me to eat noodles, uh, it's not the same as if I want to eat noodles, and then you're for forcing me as well. So, like, if you put a gun on my head and tell me kill this person, and I don't want to kill this person, but I have to because I want to save my life, uh, versus if you put a gun on my on my head and tell me kill this person, and I immediately kill that person because I wanted to kill them anyways, and I was gonna kill them anyways. Uh, in terms of accountability, I would still be account. Uh, uh, I, I'm much more accountable on the second example than on the first. So that's compatibilism. That's a, a way to get around uh, 
um, the problem of free will. But another answer to to, to that uh, discussion, and uh, sorry for not getting so much into the book, I feel like uh, you probably already know about this book. Uh, it's not the right uh, like. It, the most interesting aspects of it for me are its uh, philosophical implications and that's what I want to be talking about and uh, yeah my my other objection to the book is that it it assumes that you like not not the book sorry but the thesis of determinism which um, is the one that uh, the um, the general the, the, the patrician uh, Rios I think uh, was um, taking for what he understood of psychohistory. I'm not saying that is exactly what psychohistory is, but to a degree, yes, like your individual actions don't really matter. You can exercise your free will, you will still end up here, right? And through that kind of like uh, stream of thinking, um, people come to the conclusion that uh, there is uh, no good and evil, that there is no morality, or at least people in the history of philosophy comes to those conclusions, um, and so on and so forth. Another strong counter argument to that for me is that first of all, the observer in pretty much all cases modifies the behavior of of uh, of the observe of the observed. We've seen that with one of us with chimpanzees, we've seen that also with particles. There is an experiment in which particles go through a hole. Um, they change their behavior depending on whether they are being recorded or not. This is I don't remember the name of this part of this um, this uh, experiment, but it's very famous and it's been used many, many times to speak about things like free will. Uh, of course, um, quantum particles are also an argument for that, but I'm more interested in, in just how often we modify our 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 like the things we observe in order for them to give us the results, they subconsciously modify them or, or just influence them and I, I assume that they don't have will but they actually do and, uh, and and they themselves modify their behavior just because they are being watched by us, just because they are being put into a, uh, into a single limited uh, uh, spectrum of possibilities and, and then of course they are behaving in a limited way. Uh, but perhaps the space in which particles move and the possibilities that are presented to them on a non-humanly uh, engineered uh, scenario are infinite and therefore impossible to reproduce in a lab. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my my take on on, the, on that subject. I I think that when we look at the world and try to explain it, we pretty much always end up explaining something about ourselves rather than the world itself. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that all science is flawed. I'm just saying that all too often science is shaped by human assumptions, human biases, uh, the premises, premises made by humans and uh, perspectives. Uh, that are all too human. So, when we look at something and call it objective, we only mean that that thing is at consensus among humans to be true, to be that way. Not that it's really objective beyond humanity. It's the best we have, and I think it would be good if we we're more aware of it because that is also one of the reasons why uh, science has always been uh, misused for non-scientific purposes, just to put it that way. Although science is uh, not value-based, or that is uh, what uh, some people like to think, and and therefore all purposes are scientific, scientific as long as they accord to the scientific method. But yeah, I mean, tell me what you think about that, and I'll get back to you. If if anyone gives me like a cool answer that I didn't think about, then I'll make another video. Have a nice day.